I'm actually going to start the recording. Okay, so what defines good vision? Well, if you think about um, an analogy, so a lot of times, like I said, people think good vision is eyesight or 2020 vision. But that's like saying that just because you can hear, you can listen. Now, we wouldn't say that. We all know that hearing and listening are definitely not the same thing. Well, the same is true of vision. Eyesight is just one part of the visual system. And it basically what it means is that you can see a certain size letter at a certain distance. So the first 20 stands for basically 20 feet away. And the second 20 has to do with the size of the letter. So at the top of the eye chart, usually it's 2400 or 2200 letter. That's the big E. And as you go down the eye chart, you'll see um, the letters get smaller. So above the green line is 2040. That's generally what we want you to see in order to drive, especially without glasses. And then um, above the red line is uh, 2020 line. So primarily, it's a distance me measurement. So one thing that we do know and studies have shown is that needing glasses for distance is not really associated with reading and learning difficulties. In fact, kids who need glasses for distance are nearsighted, and those tend to be the kids that do really well in school. They usually um, have um, uh, are more avid readers and, and do, tend to do better with reading. So there is no association with needing um, glasses for distance and uh, and reading and learning. Um, there are some patients who are also the opposite of nearsighted, farsighted. Those are the patients that maybe wear their, their distance glasses um, may affect also their near glasses. Same goes with astigmatism. We're not going to get a lot into that today. Um, that's basically something that can um, often be managed with glasses. So assuming they have the right correction on, what are some of the other visual skills that are required to learn? So here we're gonna look at um, teaming, focusing, tracking, and processing. Let's start with eye teaming. So eye teaming is the ability to have, um, create a single picture. So you have two eyes, they both need to be pointing in the same place at the same time in order to get the image single and clear. So, so that's also what gives us uh, good depth perception and good eye hand, hand coordination, as well as um, helps us with some gross and fine motor tasks. If you don't have good eye teaming skills um, or things a little bit off, a lot of times then you can get double vision. So this is an example of what it could like could look like if you're having double vision. Some other symptoms uh, that are often experienced with kids with eye teaming problems include um, intermittent double vision, eye strain, fatigue and headaches, rubbing their eyes or excessive blinking. And they might think that the print is moving or wiggling around the page. Basically that just means that their visual system isn't very stable. So sometimes it's single, sometimes it's not, or sometimes they're working to get things to be clear and single. You might also notice that they try to compensate by covering one eye or tilting your head. Visual focusing skills are the ability to maintain clear focus at near and the ability to switch focus between distance and near quickly. So generally that skill develops about four months of age. Um, usually in adulthood, we start to have some problems with reading, um, our arms are too short is kind of the joke. If you're anywhere near age 40, you can start to see a decline in your ability to focus up close. But in kids, this is supposed to be easy and automatic. But what happens sometimes is that those skills don't develop or something happens to interrupt those skills, um, such as concussion. And then things get a little more difficult. So they can get blurry, um, you can get distorted. Oftentimes these are seen in conjunction with an eye teaming problem. Um, so often that blurry vision is intermittent or only when reading, or maybe after they've been reading for a while, um, they feel like their eyes have to work to focus on the page. That may create some eye strain, headaches, or fatigue. 
Um, they might uh, especially have difficulty with reading smaller print or transitioning to uh, chapter books. And they may have some difficulty maintaining then attention on the reading task. So often the ones that persevere are the ones that are more likely to have the eye strain and fatigue. Um, but a lot of kids just give up and stop paying attention long before it gets to that point. So avoidance is a big red flag. For some, they have um, complaint of blurry distance at, at or blurry vision at distance. And how that happens um, is even though they may not need glasses for distance, what happens is the muscles in the eye that are um, having to work to get things clear up close, sometimes they get spasm a little bit and get stuck. And so when they try to look far away, those muscles aren't fully relaxing. So they might complain that the board is blurry, but really it's a flexibility of the focusing system that's uh, the real issue. Uh, the third uh, visual skill is uh, eye movement or tracking skills. So that's the ability to track and follow with your eyes. So this includes um, moving from one point to another, that we call those uh, saccades, and following a moving object. Um, it's important to note that poor eye teaming and focusing skills can often interfere with the eye tracking. Um, eye tracking does develop starts to develop, develop at a really young age um, as well, as you can imagine, um, but it doesn't fully develop to an adult-like level until about age 10. So there's a um, progression that goes on as far as the quality of eye movement goes. Generally by age five, kids can track and follow with minimal head movement, minimal to no body movement, and with fairly good accuracy. So to give you an idea how um, eye movement skills can interfere with reading. Um, in this video, we see uh, some infrared eye tracking uh, going on. So the one on the left has not as good eye tracking skills. You can see the eyes are jumping around. Um, they're not keeping their place. They're sometimes jumping backwards. Whereas the person on the recording on the right. This is a post-vision therapy patient. Um, you can see that the eyes are moving along like they should, kind of like a typewriter. So kind of that typewriter effect where the eyes are moving across the page, left to right, they get to the end, they find the next line easily. So if you don't have good um, eye tracking skills, what can happen is that, of course, you're gonna lose your place more. Um, you're gonna have to reread information and you're going to have um, slow reading or poor fluency. Sometimes the words get inserted out of order. This can sometimes happen with the eye teaming problems as well. Um, they might skip over small words. And then pursuits, <clears throat> which is more the ability to follow a moving object, this can affect more sports or, or just general coordination. So they might appear a little bit more clumsy. They might have difficulty with sports and have trouble catching and tracking a ball. So those eye movements don't necessarily always affect reading, but the saccades um, will. So again, what can a vision and reading problem look like? So you could have um, more homework battles, saying I can't before trying. Um, a lot of this comes from the avoidance of the task, the frustration, and a lot of it has to do with just the amount of effort that it takes to, to look at the page, keep it clear, keep it single, and coordinate everything together. Um, oftentimes, these patients can look more uh, like their attention deficit or attention deficit with hyperactivity. Um, in fact, one study showed that um, kids with labeled uh, with ADHD were three times more likely to also have a, an IT mean problem as well. Once they treated the IT mean problem, a lot of the academic behaviors and inattention scores um, were reduced, so they had less symptoms of uh, attention deficit. A lot of times these kids will get labeled as lazy because they're avoiding their work or they're just not able to pay attention to it. And overall, they'll just be fa failing to meet their potential. If you can imagine these skills, the effort that it requires to keep things clear and single takes a lot away from also from the comprehension of the material that they're trying to learn. Next, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. So up until now, we've kind of talked a little, a lot about um, the visual motor skills, 
<clears throat> that are required to, for reading. Now I want to talk a little bit more about visual processing. So of course, if you have um, difficulty with the input of information, such as the teaming, tracking, and um, focusing skills, uh, it's going to interfere with um, how well you're able to, like I said, comprehend that information. Um, but we also, I also will look at a, a child and see where are their visual processing skills or called visual perceptual skills at, because that too can um, interfere with the learning process, especially reading. So when I'm talking about visual processing and visual perceptual skills, that really is about bringing meaning to what we see. And I'll give you an example to start out. So here's a picture. And if you've never seen it before, you might think it maybe is something that looks like an ink blot or something like that. It may not mean a lot to you. But this is actually a picture of something we see quite often in Wisconsin on a regular basis. In fact, it's a big part of uh, the Wisconsin economy. So when I um, switch the slide and I kind of define what those ink blots actually are a little bit, you can kind of start to see that it's a cow. So down at the bottom, you have the outline of the nose, um, the ears, and the body. So now, when I go back to this picture, um, without the lines in there to define the space, you can see, yes, I can see the cow now. In fact, it's hard to unsee it once you've seen it. So a lot of, um, this is one example of what visual information processing is about. It's really about what interpreting what we see. And uh, some of the visual perceptual skills that can interfere with reading um, include these listed here. So let's go over each one individually. So we'll start with laterality and directionality. Um, directionality, kind of like what it sounds, is really about understanding directions. So um, laterality is understanding directions on yourself, so up, down, right, and especially right and left. Directionality is understanding it on others or applying it to objects. Again, it's, it's uh, that sense of direction. So why is this important? Well, in our real world, if I hold up a pen and, and hold it in different positions, it's always a pen. It doesn't change. Um, it's only in reading and writing where directions starts to matter. So B's and D's are essentially the same, a uh, circle and a line, um, but the direction that those face is, becomes very important. So if there's a developmental process that goes on, so usually about age five, kids start to learn and understand, you know, right and left on themselves. Usually by seven or eight, they can start to do it better with, with um, other people and objects. And there's a progression that we see with letter reversals. So you, most five-year-olds, it's normal to have some letter reversals. Um, and usually by age, again, seven or eight, or sometimes nine, we really shouldn't be seeing any letter reversals. And part of that has to do with they are um, better able to define those and have a sense of direction, as well as the practice that they made with those eye movements from left to right. So poorly, a child that has poor body awareness, poor uh, ability to understand right and left, will usually reverse letters more than a child who has those concepts down. Um, visual discrimination. So visual discrimination is the ability to discriminate details or notice the details. Um, so this is important for being able to recognize similar looking words are really different. Um, visual figure ground is the ability to find the relevant information in a crowded background. So a good example would be something like a hidden picture where you're trying to find the information that you're looking for. Um, but it also would apply to being able to um, um, separate out the relevant information in a passage. Visualization um, is one of the most important visual perceptual skills for reading, um, in my opinion. Um, so visualization comes from being able to remember what you see. Um, so that can affect, visual memory can affect the ability to quickly recall words, uh, but also can affect writing as well. Um, those two things actually happen sometimes in different parts of the brain. And the um, visual sequential memory is being able to remember things in a sequence. And visual closure is, Let's say if you take a picture 
but it's kind of incomplete. Somebody who's kind of erased the lines, being able to um, fill in those gaps. That helps with quicker recognition of words. So visual memory, visual sequential memory, visual closure are three ways that we somewhat can measure some visualization skills. But um, another reason why visualization is so important is it plays a role in the whole comprehension piece as well. So if you can picture what you're reading, you'll be better able to remember what you're reading. That affects other learning processes as well. But in reading comprehension, it also becomes really important. And um, going back to the visual memory piece as well, um, it also plays a big role in spelling and being able to spell correctly, especially those words that are not phonetically spelled. <clears throat> Other visual perceptual skills um, uh, that we look at is visual motor integration visual and visual auditory integration. So visual motor integration um, usually uh, affects more of the writing, so that's being able to coordinate. Um, usually, you're, we're talking about um, your eyes with your hands as related to handwriting, um, but certainly can also apply to other skills as well. And visual auditory integration applies to more of the reading, so that's being able to link what you see to the auditory system, so speech. So uh, that's where. Um, you know, in essence, reading is. So what can be done to improve these visual skills? So most of the issues, especially the issues that we're talking about um, as far as the teaming, tracking, and focusing, um, are usually best treated with vision therapy, um, more specifically optometric vision therapy. And what that is is a progressive, Individualized program is designed to remediate and enhance visual skills and visual information processing. So typically vision therapy when needs to involve certain lenses and prisms, filters and patches, um, and a general knowledge of what's going on in the entire visual system, including the refractive error, including um, eye health issues. Um, and typically, um, while every optometrist is exposed to vision therapy in their uh, training. Not all doctors go on to actually specialize in the area, and that's where postdoctoral training is usually involved. Um, the use of lenses, prisms, and filters in patches is why um, occupational therapists um, cannot necessarily do vision therapy. They can do some vision, definitely vision processing, visual perceptual things, maybe work on some tracking, but they're not gonna be able to um, address um, eye focusing in those eye teaming issues because those are usually require um, lenses and prisms in therapy and again um, a more in-depth knowledge of the visual system. As far as how successful vision therapy is, well the National Institute of Health has looked at and extensively studied um, our most common diagnosis that we treat, which is called convergence deficiency or inability to converge the eyes. It's related back to the eye teaming problems that I was talking about. And what they found was that after 12 weeks of vision therapy, 75% of patients um, showed a significant improvement in their symptoms. Um, at the end of the program, um, they also not only shown, showed significant improvement in their symptoms, but they also showed that they were basically essentially cured so that they no longer had the condition. 87% um, of those with those focusing issues that I was talking about, eye focusing issues, are also called accommodative difficulties, were also successfully treated. Uh, so we're gonna just take a few minutes at the end here to talk a little bit about ways that you can reduce visual stress on the eyes. So if you do have a child that has these issues, how can you help? So one thing I always think about is how um, you're presenting the material. So generally, if we hold a book, we don't hold it flat on the desk. We hold it at a little slant. In fact, um, when, I was, when I was a kid, um, we actually had desks that were slanted. And the reason for that is that um, it is actually much more comfortable on the eyes, much better for reading and writing, to have material on a slant, much more natural for our eyes. Um, we also should try to 
strive to have the material elbow to knuck their elbow to knuckle distance from the page, so not mine, but the child. That's called the Harmon system. Again, there was a lot of research done on that in later years that kind of has gotten lost along the way, but that's the ideal distance to hold the have the material. Um, I usually recommend that you sit in a comfortable chair that allows the feet to touch the ground. You don't want any dangling feet. That's not good, um, but it still allows for for harm and distance. And maybe that chair, if you're not at a desk, maybe that's a comfortable chair where um, you're you're sitting on the couch or something like that. But then the feet need to be up, and you need to be the child needs to be well grounded. Um, other ways to reduce visual stress is to increase the the size of the print and the spacing of the print. So I think a lot of kids um, who have gotten into chapter books that have these type of problems um, tend to gear towards those like witty kid type books where the print is a little bit bigger um, and the spacing is bigger. And the reason for that is that most kids don't have, um, that have these problems um, have a lot more difficult time when the print is smaller and more closely spaced. That's why a lot of kids, these problems don't even show up until they uh, are trying to transition into chapter books. Um, it also helps to decrease the amount of information on the page. So sometimes it will just take a, like a white notebook card and just kind of block off some of the information. Not necessarily blocking off the whole page, going line by line. Um, that's, the eye movements work best if they're able to see where they're going next. So again, I won't always block everything off, but I will block off maybe just the paragraph that they're trying to look at. Um, and that kind of goes to kind of decreasing the, the visual confusion. So what I mean, mean by visual confusion, so it's the amount that's on the page. So here's an example how um, some kids get, get, uh, get uh, let's see, hung up on math as well as reading that have these type of problems, partly because let's say you put 100 problems on the page, they just become visually overwhelmed with how much they have to look at. So um, I recommend trying to, um, limit how much is on the page and or again use those techniques where you're blocking off part of the information maybe showing only one line at a time and then increasing physical activity so um, building up some gr good gross motor skills are always a good idea um, but just time away from near activities um, a lot of times on screens um, especially if someone that has an eye teaming problem they'll tend to maybe um, start to shut off one eye or just use one eye versus both eyes. Um, so it can kind of exacerbate sometimes certain uh, uh, vision problems. So try to limit the screen time to at least two hours or less per day. Um, and also try to limit, and sometimes they even say eliminate some of the handheld games, um, such as the Nintendo DSs and the, uh, um, the games that you play on your phone. Um, if you'd like to find out more information, um, you can check out um, our website. Um, you can also look at the national website, which is www.covd.org. Um, you feel free to email us, call us for more information. Um, we do have um, our Facebook page as well, and we also have um, a it's almost monthly or every other month where we, we send out a blog or a newsletter. So if you'd like to sign up for that, you can see that on our website as well. So I'm going to um, unmute everybody. And then if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to, to ask those now. So does anyone have any, any questions about what I've gone over? Okay. Um, well, if there aren't any other questions, then I guess we'll end the webinar here. Um, and uh, just making sure, is there any questions at all? Okay. Okay, then we'll go ahead and end here. Again, if you wanna follow up and you have any questions for our office, go ahead. Um, thanks, thank you all and have a good afternoon.